Okay, we are live on Facebook now on in the okay, water great. and climate uh, group. So I'm also gonna, just gonna click record on Zoom. All right, but let me introduce you, Kristen. Kristen. So this is Kristen Crash. And uh, Kristen is co-founder and director of Sueño de Vida Regenerative Living Project in Ecuador. Prior to moving, Kristen, Kristen was known for her gorilla gardens productive green spaces she created in any available space. Now an urban transplant in the South American rainforest, she has adapted her gardening and sustainability skills to large scale reforestation of degraded land. She takes a practical and accessible approach to helping others achieve more balance and self-sufficiency in their lives. And Kristen was also a, a yoga uh, instructor in the Washington DC area, am I right, Kristen? And then how did you yes, that's true. decide to move to Ecuador? How did that happen? Um, that story? I'll tell you what, we have a visitor with us right now, uh, oh. my friend Lizandra, and um, we're the same age, but she's kind of going through like a burnout phase. And I'm in this phase of my life where I'm in my mid forties and I feel like I'm actually working for the first time in my life, even though now I'm working completely for myself. And maybe that's why I have so much energy and drive right now to work for myself. Um, I did. I taught yoga for 16 years. I taught uh, 14,000 yoga classes during that time. I was considered like a pretty well-known and senior teacher in the D.C. area. And um, but the, the thing that always relaxed me, what I could do on my day off was get in my backyard or even if I was renting a house or renting an apartment, I would use a community space and grow food and grow flowers and grow herbs. And, and, and I would take over the most like derelict looking spaces you could imagine. It could be back alleys, a little perimeter around a parking lot if there was a little spit of dirt in it. And I just had a, a flair and a, a talent for understanding that if I would just like take all the leaves that everybody else was raking up and putting in bags on their sidewalks and steal those or filch them and put those on those little perimeters of bad soil that I found, that it would do better, that it would become fertile, that it would, it would, it would go from being dead to alive, basically. So that was like my my haven, really, that was like how I was able to relax after teaching like 25 yoga classes in a week. I love teaching yoga, but you know, any, anything, I mean, come on, it's a job. I mean, anything you do is a job. And gardening and growing food and, and transforming derelict spaces into productive garden spaces, it began to be what I really wanted to do. That was like, okay. And then I, so I was doing that. I was really into it. I was producing massive amounts of food in small spaces. Um, I was going out into areas and like planting trees that I had germinated from seed, kind of like gorilla tree planting, cleaning up what local watersheds. And then I met Juan, who is my partner now. And um, we, he told me that he was, wanted to go back to Ecuador, which was where he's from. And I was at a place where in my life where I was like, Man, I'm living in Washington, D.C. It's one of the most expensive cities in the United States. I had also lived in New York. I has also lived in Chicago. And my income at that point had kind of flatlined, but this cost of living kept escalating and escalating and escalating. And I went from swimming to treading water. It's almost feeling like I was drowning. And I said, you know what? Let's let's go to Ecuador. And let's like, let's go, let's, I'll go too. <laughs> I just, like, so um, I kind of piggybacked on my, my partner and uh, we came here together and we didn't have a plan to do a whole regenerative forest project right away. We weren't quite sure. We, we wanted to do something that involved growing our own food that was about sustainability. Um, and then when we got here, when we started to go out and see land that had been cloud forest, which a cloud forest is a, a rainforest, but at a slightly higher altitude. And it's actually even more biodiverse than a rainforest and see how the land around in the cloud forest was being cleared. It was just, be, it had been like denuded. It was basically pasture and an artificial pasture. 
And um, and that was when like we started to get this inkling, like it's not just about us going off grid and being like off grid bush people. And because that we are, we're pretty much like off grid bush people. But we also got this larger vision of healing, of like healing the land and regenerating the land and bringing the, the balance of wildlife back into the land. And um, yeah, that's how we got started. Um, but we made a ton of mistakes. We had no idea what we were doing. We didn't have a lot of money. And um, so I think a lot of those things though were actually very helpful in a way because both Juan and I are sort of people that like, we believe that like, if you have to, you can. So, <laughs> so because of our lack of options and at that point being committed to this and not really having a way out, we, we had to commit and we had to follow through with it, even if we made mistakes. So we just kept going and um, we were able to see because it's a subtropical climate and in subtropics, things happen much faster than they do in a temperate climate. Everything happens faster. We were able to see not only the effects of our mistakes, but also the effects of the things that we did right and build on that. And um, one of the things that we were able to understand that we were doing right was just planting as much vegetation as possible. And by planting as much vegetation as possible and creating leaf fall and creating things, plants that needed eventually to be cut back and pruned by adding as much organic matter to this stripped clay, nasty subsoil that was here when we got here, we were able to see the effects of that very quickly. And when I say like see the effects, I mean like it was the difference between walking in boots and taking a step in the wrong direction and literally going down to your thigh in mud because there was no sponge in the soil. There was nothing to soak up the, the massive rains hmm. to being able to walk around like in regular shoes and just feel the, the sponginess in the ground underneath you and how much water all that organic matter that we were putting on the soil was actually holding. So what we were doing was actually making our own lives a lot more comfortable because now we're able to actually walk around our land without feeling like we're walking in the, the fire swamp and the princess bride that like you go down in the mud and you're not going to come back out. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that was really thrilling. And not right. only did it improve our lives walking around, but by having vegetation growing on many different levels, which is really, really important. That's like something that I'm really adamant about talking about the importance of it. Because if you plant like all one thing and it's all on one level, you can only host whatever wildlife lives on that level. So it's gonna be like one kind of bird, one kind of insect, one kind of frog. But if you have banana trees growing up really tall and cassava plants down a little bit lower and vining plants sprawling across the ground. Now you're creating a host system for different types of life that live on all those different levels. And that's really important because I'll tell you what, when humans mess with an ecosystem, like in a way that destroys it, mm -hmm. the bad pesty animals that bite us and suck our blood and give us malaria, they're the ones that stick around. Right. Because I think, I'm serious, like I think they're trying to get us back out of the picture. Hmm. So by healing the ecosystem by planting vegetation on a lot of different levels, you bring in dragonflies and you bring in frogs and you bring in lizards and you bring in birds that start to bring this pest population under control. And so, um, so our lives also became more pleasant because we got fewer insect bites and we weren't itching all the time and we weren't suffering so much because we could actually see dragonflies now going around and picking off the mosquitoes. Um, well, so there were you, like I hear you things. describing. I hear you describing a couple of different concepts. One is that you know, I tell people that a forest has multiple layers. 
uh, planting trees alone, that trees are only one or maybe two levels of a forest. You also want the bush layer, you want the vines, you want the grasses, right. and the wildflowers. Right. And, you know, and, and so that's, you know, that's one thing. A forest has multiple layers and each layer is important to all the ecosystems. And, uh, and another thing you're saying is that, you know, the more of a variety of plant life that you have, that's going to attract a variety of insects. That's going to constitute uh, an ecosystem that serves as a form of natural pest control. And mm -hmm. the bug, you know, the, every insect has predators that eat it. And uh, if you, you know, you nurture that diversity of plant life, then it's going to, to nurture a diversity of of, of insects and insects predators so that things tend to stay in balance. Right. Yeah. And we had a, maybe in our second year, uh, we, I was really working on establishing the shrub layer. And because at that point we had already planted the canopy layer, but it hadn't grown up yet. It hadn't gotten really tall. So I was waiting for the canopy layer to get established, which we use a lot of uh, bananas and plantains because they grow very quickly. So then I was planting a lot of shrub layer plants, um, fruiting shrubs, especially because it's good to have also things to eat. And we had a terrible grasshopper problem. We had those, those grasshoppers that just like defoliate everything. And they were going around and they were eating all my shrubs. And I didn't do anything about it. I mean, I was like, what am I gonna, I'm not gonna go out there and spray. It's just kind of like, this is just telling me that something is out of whack, right? By the following year, our canopy layer had grown up tall enough to house the birds that eat those grasshoppers. And since then, we have not had a grasshopper problem. So we still have grasshoppers and occasionally you'll see a nibbled leaf here and there, but it's not enough that they go out and they just like defoliate everything. Mm. So a lot of the times it's establishing the system and it's also like just giving it time because they're trees, they're not like, they don't grow on our schedule, mm -hmm. you know? So sometimes noticing something like grasshoppers defoliating your plants, it's not necessarily like horrible. It just might take time for the system to regulate itself. Um, so and me, that's the great thing how, about planting diversity. Hmm? Yeah. How long have you been there and what have you seen happen since you've been there and you know where are you now and where would you like to be in the future okay so we've been here this is our sixth year and um when we came there was nothing there was uh just grass pasture and um something i want to be really explain very clearly is that I really believe that there's a holistic regenerative management system for every biosphere on this planet, but there's a specific regenerative system for every specific biosphere on this planet. And I understand and I, I follow very well the work of people like Alan Savory and Steve Kenyon and Gabe Brown who do regenerative agriculture with cattle and large ruminants. And I think that that's very successful and perfectly appropriate for the prairies and savanna climates that they are working in. Mm -hmm. But just like it would be wildly inappropriate and irresponsible to go into a savanna climate and plant a bunch of banana plants, it's also wildly irresponsible and ineffective to come into a rainforest and impose a pasture on a rainforest. Um, it's, it's also really sad because not only does it crumble the ecosystem, um, so this well, is what happened to us. We that. moved here and the land had been denuded and it was a pasture. Let me kind of like tell the story. Right. And, and what happens is when you take out the canopy of trees from a rainforest, the rain comes down with three times as much force as when it's mitigated by the foliage above. It just hits the ground. Like, bah, 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 bah. And, and it creates this muddy slurry that just lifts up and, and washes away. And all of the nitrogen and all of the nutrients just wash out with it. And it gets into the rivers and it causes algae bloom and it pollutes the rivers and it's a big problem. And then a lot of times what happens is the work crews that the logging companies use to take out the trees are the ones that they auction the land off to 
very cheaply now that it's been denuded and they pay them basically with this denuded land. And most of these guys coming down with the chainsaws to cut down the trees are not from the rainforest. They're usually from higher altitudes. So they don't know anything about how to cultivate like tropical or subtropical plants, but what they understand is cows. So they sow a clone's grass seed that is an invasive species from Africa in the South American rainforest to graze their cattle on. And this grass is actually, because it's cloned and it's not a mixed variety, is very nutrient poor. So the cattle, the cows suffer. The dairy farmers don't make as much money as they should because the cows are not happy and they're not productive and they're plagued by tropical parasites here. And you have all the damage done to the ecosystem. So it's like lose for the climate, lose for the animals, lose for the people. It's, a, it's just a three-way losing situation. So that's what we walked into was this denuded land and this very compacted clay soil that all the nutrients had been washed out. And that's why like we just you'd sink down to your knees in mud because there was there was no matter to like soak up the rainfall. And um, and so after about two years, the first two years were really a struggle. And then once our canopy plants started to take off a little bit and, and some natural pioneer regeneration started to happen. We started getting leaf fall. We started noticing more sponginess in the ground and a lot less runoff. And I think that that's like a huge point for whoever is watching this, that no matter what is the size of the ecosystem that you're working with, even if your ecosystem is your backyard, a, a good sponge in your soil will do more work than the most like intricate right. pipes and right. your, like, you know, drainage system and installing a bunch of stuff. And you really just like the amount of leaf fall, like working leaf fall into the ground, how much water that can absorb and filtrate and hold is incredible. And because I'm not speaking from statistics and I'm not speaking from reading academic papers I'm speaking from a place of like walking around on this ground and feeling it under my feet mm -hmm. that I know that that is true you know and so that was one of the biggest like ground. if you mm -hmm. have that spongy ground then it's like yeah there are different strategies for capturing the rain where it falls you know we can do earthworks and build ponds and swales and things like that but you have your plant matter that creates healthy soil that soil is going to soak up more than just about anything else right absolutely yeah and also the plants living in the soil like through their root systems like they pull up a whole lot of water i mean bamboo in and of itself is basically like a big straw that actually holds water inside the columns of the bamboo. Um, I have actually watched during really heavy rainstorms, banana plants will, but a banana is not a tree, it's just a plant. And what it is is the trunk is just all the leaves furled up into a tube. And then when the plant needs to evaporate water out of it, when it gets waterlogged, it just sends out a leaf. And I've actually been sitting like looking out my window in the middle of a rainstorm and actually watched banana leaves just like unfurl <laughs> from a plant. I mean, it's, it's that dramatic. It's just like, Foof, and all this water flies off of it, you know? So it's, it's really thrilling to observe, you know, those types of changes. And like I said, it just also makes life a lot easier. Um, we have a very simple system of trenches that channel water down from like the wettest parts of the land into a small holding pond. And then what I do is at the end of every raining season, I clean that pond out of all of the silt that has collected in that pond because there's a lot of nutrients in that silt. And I use it in my nursery and I germinate seeds in that silt. That's basically like my potting soil. Hmm. Um, and it's a very, very simple system. There's no pipes. There's nothing in the ground. Um, there's nothing that, that will get silted up and damaged and that you need to take it out. It's just a very simple trench system. And, and we only had to dig that because in the first two years, we really needed to just to move the water, you know, into like a holding pond where it could be filtered and then move back down because we have a spring 
And we didn't want all that runoff going down into the spring because that's the water that we drink. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but at this point, honestly, with the trenches, like I'm not even sure we need them anymore. Like we, they still get water in them and they still carry to the pond, but it's not like it was five years ago where it was like a river, you know? Now the soil and the plants, they, they soak a lot of that up. Um, Another thing that I notice, and this is like kind of getting a little bit more into the science of, of bioprecipitation, is there didn't used to be a mist overhanging our lands. So we have now neighbors, people that we've attracted to our project that have bought adjacent properties to ours. So we've gone from managing three hectares, which is about seven and a half acres, and now we manage 15 hectares, which is about 35 acres. So by regenerating or allowing some of that to naturally regenerate 35 acres of land, which is not that much, mm -hmm. it's, it's big, but it's not huge. Yeah, right. Just by regenerating 35 acres of land, we see mist overhanging our landscape, our enclosure that we did not see five years ago. So and what that's is that mist from? Beautiful. What's the mist from? What, it, what causes that? The mist? The mist is, uh, cloud forests are very, they're very concentrated sources of their own rain. So I believe it's from at night, the leaves of all the new trees opening up and releasing the bacteria from the undersides of their leaves from their stomata, and then gathering up all the water vapor in the air and holding it until it's heavy enough to come back down as rain. Um, as that's how I understand it scientifically. And that's what I'm able to observe in my daily life, because it doesn't just stay as mist. It also, it's called what they call, what they call fog drip. So that as it gets heavy enough, it comes down as sort of like a very light rain. And, um, that's actually the major source of water, even though we do get a lot of heavy rains in the rainy season, in the dry season, the major source of water for plants is that, that fog drip, that mist. So and is, without it, go ahead. When, when is the rainy season and when is the dry season? Uh, the rainy season is from December until the end of May. And then in June, it begins to dry out a little bit. And then that lasts until November. But we don't have a true dry season. We have like a rainy season and a less rainy season. I mean, it's always pretty wet here. But in the rainy season, we have like monsoon style rains. And in the dry season, we have more like this misty drizzle. So, but without that misty drizzle, I, I think a lot of the plants here would dry out and die pretty quickly. So that mist is, is extremely important. And the delicate, the most delicate life forms in the cloud forest, the, the epiphytes, plants that live on other plants like orchids and vines, they're completely dependent on that mist because they never touch the ground. So their, their, their like ephemeral root systems don't even get rain. So they're completely dependent on that fog drip. And our area of Ecuador alone is home to over 4,000 endemic epiphytes that live here and absolutely nowhere else in the world. And if they go out of existence, they go out of existence everywhere forever, that's it. Mm -hmm. So for biodiversity, this is an extremely important um, little corridor in, in the world. Um, so yeah, um, let's see, what else have we ever So where we are now is we're, in a, we're getting into a much better place. We're producing a good amount of our own food. Um, we have fish ponds and um, we're now in a place to, do you hear that bird? Yeah, is that a bird? Do you hear that? Is that a bird? It's a falcon, yeah. <laughs> it's called the laughing falcon. <laughs> so does the, does the falcon does the, the falcon's a predator and it eats what? Uh, rodents and other birds and things like and that. And snakes. Snakes, yeah. Yeah, they're, the main prey of this particular falcon are snakes. Mm -hmm. So you want this falcon around. Right. He's a good guy. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and they, they only come if they see tall perches that they can perch in where they can see their prey. So the fact that we have these falcons is yet another sign that our ecosystem is, you know, is getting into a good place. Um, so one of the things that I'm really uh, intent on now is talking about 
food diversity, because we've talked a little bit about plant diversity and wildlife diversity, but now we're getting into the sphere where we're cultivating a wide diversity of foods and we're cultivating many foods that are very rich in protein and fat. So um, something that I'm on a mission for the next like several years of my life is to somehow expand people's awareness and create markets for some of these very nutrient dense biodiverse foods. Because I like think what? one of the problems, the big problem is that people tend to see forestry as being for nature yeah. and not being for people. Right. That you have to cut down forests to grow food. And so I'm really on the mission to show people that forests grow food and forests actually grow nutrient dense food that people have thrived on in the past and can thrive on again. And one of the reasons why I think that we're ingrained into this belief that we need to cut down trees to grow food is because we've, we've allowed ourselves to become so dependent on like the quote unquote staple cereal yeah. grains, right. wheat, rice, soy, right. corn, and like, these are garbage. Yeah. I mean, they for are. human consumption, they are. you they can't are. live on that. Right. You know? <laughs> but they constitute 66% of our diet. I know. Like five crops. I know. Of of trash. Yeah. And and, and the biological diversity in our diet like, has gone down, 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 down in the last 50 to 75 years. It just continues to go down, down, down. It doesn't keep going down. If people knew we 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 used to live on such a diversity of uh, of foods uh, uh, of plants and animals and and nuts and things like that, and we're just nuts more and, and more just and getting oil. out of a cereal yeah. box. You know, we're eating uh, so, mm -hmm. too much cereal and not enough other things. And and the, and the cereals are exactly. bad for you know the annual food, the the hardest group of the you know, annuals are just really, really hard e ecologically. They're hard on the biosphere, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, you, they leave, when you harvest, you leave huge patches of bare soil. Yeah. And I, I, I can speak from personal experience in terms of regenerating a rainforest. And I can speak from personal experience about regenerating um, backyards, because these are things that I've done. But one of the people that came down here who bought one of our adjacent properties and is now transforming it with agroforestry, um, this fella, his family, they're big wheat farmers in Saskatchewan, Canada. And this year they lost almost their entire crop to the, the heat drought up there. And when I told him that one of the reasons they lost their crop to their heat drought was because of deforestation in Brazil, right. Right. because the the flying rivers that go up from the, the rainforest down here that flow up there were now being diminished. He was like, wow. I mean, I had no idea that that's where our part of our rainfall was coming from. Um, but he's a good fella and he understands. He's like, I don't want to do what my family is doing for a reason. You know, I want to contribute to an agroforestry project because I believe in my heart of hearts that that is regenerative and like my family farm is actually degenerative. And they really saw the price of what they were doing, you know, this year, because when you, after you harvest and you just leave all that bare soil, it just creates, it just bakes and creates heat and sends up sensible heat into the atmosphere. And there's no, there's, there's like, there's nothing you can do once your field starts baking like that. Um, so I steered him towards the work of Steve Kenyon, who ironically is in Alberta, right next to this fella. And I said, you know, check out what this guy is doing. Like he's armoring his soil with cover crops. He's, you know, I'm, I'm not like super expert on big regenerative scale farming in northern climates because it's not what I do. But I can at least like steer people into the direction of people, you know, who are. And that even in the northern climates, like, that's one of the things these regenerative farmers are really emphasizing is that like Gabe Brown grows like 40 different things. Yeah. He's growing alfalfa, he's growing clover, all these different, you know, cover crops to armor his soil so that it doesn't dry out. All these things for the cows 
And then he has additional revenue stream from grass fed beef. So all these different, you know, he's all these different revenue streams coming in from all these different food streams. And, you know, in terms of that style of thinking, I think for every, anybody from the backyard food grower to someone supporting their local farmers markets to the big scale regenerative farmer to someone like me who's working in agroforestry in the tropics, that paradigm has a different way of applying to each biosphere, but that paradigm can apply to everybody. Diversity right. is the key yeah. to resilience. Right. You know, that's, we can make that kind of like a nice little right. mantra, you know, diversity is the key to resilience, you know, Absolutely. no matter what you're doing or where you are. Um, so, you know, we have a, several foods that we grow here that we're growing now in like smaller quantities that I would love, this is my, over the next four or five years to bring in some more investors to start buying bigger pieces of land close to our project to start scaling up to growing some of these very protein rich plant crops and fat rich plant crops, things like avocados, palm fruit, bread nut. Um, and these were the foods that the, the indigenous people of the rainforest and cloud forest really thrived on. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the paintings by the Spaniards when they came here, of the people in this area, they were called the Yumbo, the Yumbo Indian tribe. I mean, they were just like massively healthy, you know what I mean? Oh, just yeah. muscled right. and right. just like, you know what I mean? Just so right. fit, you know? Right. And right. what they were eating was primarily the fruits of the forest. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's something that a lot of times people from temperate climates have like a limiting factor in their minds yeah. if they think of fruit as like grapes and apples and cherries. But when I say fruit, I'm talking about like coconuts and avocados and Brazil nuts and like really heavy nutrient dense food that you can also subsist on and also thrive on. Um, so that's why, you know, I think it's like, like I said, specificity across all things is really important. So that's where I would, that's where, where I'm headed. And that's where I would like this project to go would be to start producing, um, scaling up production of diverse polycultures that are based on these very, very nutrient dense foods that could become like new staple crops, you know, that can, they can, all can be dried. They all can be processed into meals. They all can be exported. So if we're going to start like, like, cause the thing about this guy's family from Canada, from Saskatchewan, like they really believe they feed the world. Like these big scale wheat farmers, they, like that's their, their that. family thing. Yeah, no, they've been yeah, told that. They've been told that. Yeah. And I'm like, there's 2 billion hungry people on this planet. It's right. almost a third of the population. Yeah. Like you're not doing a good job. Right. You know what I mean? And, and honestly, like, I mean, it's not their fault. They believe that. Like, that's their truth. That's that's what they experience in their minds. But at the same time, I think what maybe they don't realize or they do realize and at some point they just don't care is that we rice, soy, corn, these are commodities. They're not foods as far as the world markets are concerned. I know. I was, these are uh, commodities yeah. and they can they can be traded in futures. They yeah. don't even have to exist. To make money on them right you know that's like looney tunes like this is food this is what people need to eat and you have hedge fund managers out there trading on the margins of futures of a wheat crop to skim off their 0.02 percent on every trade and go eat caviar in their yacht and then you have little people like us over here like you know trying to tell people like no you're not feeding the world you're making this hedge fund manager rich Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So it's not commodities really are a disaster for uh, in a number of ways. Commodities are a disaster ecologically because they're they're monocrops. They 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 go against diversity. They're a disaster nutritionally for the same reason. If you grow your food in a monocrop, it's not going to have the same nutritional value. Plus, if you're eating too much of too few things, you're not going to get the nutrition right. you need. Uh, Mark right. Shepard has a really good discussion in his book, Restoration Agriculture, about uh, the, the same thing. Oh, we're feeding the world. Well, look at, well, let's look at corn. Does corn feed the world? If you're growing it for ethanol, it's not feeding anybody. 
Plus, you know, right. corn, it needs a, you have to supplement corn with a lot of other things because of the, you know, corn alone is toxic. If you have too much of it right. and not enough of, of anything else, plus, you know, these crops are typically grown in heavily tilled situations. They're grown with synthetic fertilizer. They're grown with a lot of pesticides. It's just, it's anything but feeding the world. In fact, the, right. uh, the most of the food in the world comes from small farms. You know, the, the big yes. farms that are taking up all the space and they're not actually producing mm -hmm. food. Right. Not very much anyway. Yeah, it's a lot of it's it's ethanol or it's for animals and feedlots. Mm -hmm. um, an interesting kind of like historical note, the, a lot of the slaves that were brought to the New World from Africa, they were fed cornmeal mash. That was like their ration mm -hmm. and they got pellagra. And they right. they suffer. They their right. health suffered, and many right. of them died from from vitamin deficiency from pellagra. And so the British switched their diet over to roasted uh, bread nuts, and like they thrived. I mean, it's a sad thing. I mean, I don't I don't want to be like, oh my god, like you know, it was horrible to like put things in the frame of like of people being enslaved. I mean. But that's a fact. That's what happened. They were force fed cornmeal mash and they died. Mm -hmm. And like, how horrible is that? Like to restrict someone's dietary intake to the point where to one crop, to the point where they actually cannot live on that. Um, and it's, it's one of the reasons why many foods here are that are super nutritionally rich mm -hmm. in especially in brazil and here in ecuador and in colombia and peru have been um kind of like socially dismissed is because they were the foods that sustained the african population and the indigenous population so it's also politicized to denigrate these foods like bread nut and peach palm and Brazil nuts and very nutrient dense foods as like not being for Europeans. And that is, you know, that's like that sort of like, like it's a very like neo-imperial, like neo like colonizer mindset to be like, we don't eat those things because Indian people, indigenous people and African people ate that food. And, and that, I think that that's thing, yeah. like, just a really important thing to realize is that like, no, like this is really good, important food. Right. And, so you know, to apply that, like. And it's good ecologically because a lot of the foods you're naming are grown from trees. They're grown from perennials as opposed to the annuals. If, you know, assuming that right now we get 70% of our calories from annuals and 30% from perennials, we need to flip that. Mm -hmm. We need to be getting the majority of our food from perennials because perennials are, you know, they tend to support the ecosystem. They support the water cycles. They support bees, butterflies, and birds. They are grown mm -hmm in a contract text of biological diversity where you have plants and animals exchanging nutrients with one another and that's how you you know you're not going to grow anything nutritional in in soil in dead soil uh, no matter how right. many added it no matter how much you add to the soil so anyway right. uh, would you want yeah, to think of healthy you know, like ecological uh food i think of perennials uh, the nuts. So, and, and a right. lot of it is education. It's like, how do we educate consumers that this is good for the environment and this is good for you nutritionally? And here's why. How? Uh, I have a question yeah. about yeah. corn. Um, Valerie has a question. Please. Uh, uh -huh. Now, haven't we changed corn from what it was when the native people grew it, you know, back in? before Columbus or the pilgrims came, because from what I understand, uh, just from following some native people or indigenous people, they talk about how more nutritious their corn is grown in the original state mm -hmm. versus what we see at the supermarket. Is that, a, is that an accurate de depiction or is that true? Partly true, but what they're, they're not telling you is they also have a traditional way of processing their corn where it's rubbed 
with salt and lime, which is like a natural substance derived from limestone. And they call that nixitating. And it co actually comes from an Aztec word because all those Aztec words have a lot of X's in them. And, mm -hmm. um, and so it's a way that they actually process the corn into a flour or into a meal to make tortillas, et cetera, that allows the vitamins, especially the B vitamins inside the kernel to become accessible to the human digestive system. So when British slave owners were feeding cornmeal mash to their slaves, they weren't doing this for them. They weren't properly processing the corn into a, di a digestible form for humans by nixitating it with lime and with salt. So even if you, if you go to the grocery store and you buy like traditional masa meal, like which is from Mexico, from like traditional corn to make tortillas at home, it will say on the back on the ingredients, corn, lime, and salt. And that is the corn that if you make tortilla with it, that your body can process. But you're also correct in that like you, but the other part is, is true that the old varieties, the native varieties of corn are also inherently more nutritious. So it's kind of like a double whammy that we've done to corn is we've, we've GMO'd it, we've cloned it, we've reduced the diversity, the number of species of corn that are available down to just basically like sugar, like sugar corn. Oh, right. And uh, cause I mean, now I live in South America, like corn here is not sweet. It's, it's very, very starchy and it's mostly used to make meals and, and flowers. Um, so by reducing the diversity of the corn species and also not processing it properly, it's the double whammy. Does that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That I'm sorry. Do you have another? I was always being because I because I want to grow corn, but I haven't been able to find like the seeds. You, you know, I just it's just the regular wow. yellow corn that you know you see growing up. You know, when you drive through Nebraska or what have you. Yeah, what you what I think what you're looking for is flint corn, and flint varieties of corn are the like the starchier varieties that are grown like for their much more nutritious and have much less much less sugar and a lot more nutrients yeah um well, and i have i actually have a book go ahead oh i was just gonna say well, um Kentucky, like hickory king and bloody butcher like there was a tradition of way more nutritional corn varieties but you can still get seed for hickory king bloody butcher and then uh susanna lean who has a permaculture farm called salamander springs has a tricolor corn that she's bred from a lot of time in el salvador and guatemala and mixing it with um old really old kentucky corns and um you can get seed from her too um that has like great completely different um you know, fat. It's so right. Fat and good. Valerie, I can put yeah. you in touch with Alice Melendez. Okay. Yeah. So message me and I'll put you in touch with Alice. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a woman in um, the Northwest of the United States in, in Southern Oregon, uh, Carol Depp. And she wrote a really great book. She's also a really good storyteller um, called The Resilient Gardener. And she's saved a lot of traditional varieties of corn and squash and beans. Um, and she's basically brought them back from the brink of extinction. And in her book, it's called The Resilient Gardener. She also talks specifically about how to like process corn and how to you know, cook with it properly and how to get the most nutrition out of it. So that's also a really good resource you can check out. It's called The Resilient Gardener by Carol, Carol Depp, D-E-P-P-E. Okay. And that, I think that'll give you some good info too. Cool. Those were good questions. Yeah. That was a good, good uh, yeah. And I love to hear about people's like local food lore. I know that in the Southeast of the United States um, where you are heart, like hickory was a really important uh, crop to the native people down there. And they would make like a hickory, like a, like a hickory meal and hickory cakes and hickory milk. And it was like, and I, I, I haven't ever tasted it, but I know people that have tasted it and they said it's like ambrosial, that it's just absolutely delicious. Um, and, you know, I think that like finding out the native food lore to your area, like for us, it's, it's bread nut and peach palm and 
these different like subtropical fruits that you know sustains the the the, the indigenous population that um I really want to learn about and I, I'm now I'm cultivating them and I want to do it more because um there's also another whole side of this that I just I've, I've read a really great book by this uh, by a, a Yale scholar named James Scott and it's called Against the Grain and no. his theory is it's like more socioeconomic but what he's talking about is that it's also a way to control people to only feed them like right. grain crops because it's right. something that can be counted stored and taxed and that when people can rely much more on what's growing in their backyards and in their like, you know, their their native ecospheres like hickory nuts and different varieties of corn and tree crops and root crops, like it's really hard to send, you know, the, the money collectors around to count those things. Um, and I think that, you know, if you're going to centralize agriculture and and make it like a real money machine and create a $300 billion a year agrochemical business around it, the easiest way to do that is to grow crops like wheat and barley and like GMO corn that can be stratified and counted and put into bags and commodified. Because it's really hard to commodify like somebody's really diverse food stream, right? At that point, that person has what we call sovereignty food yeah. sovereignty right meaning you you're like a sovereign of your food and when you only when you consume a lot of these grain crops that are controlled by major corporations and the government you you give that up you give up your food sovereignty right you right. know so i think that's Let also me name like, some i want to yeah. name some resources and then i want to quote leah pennyman oh. is a is an african-american farmer in upstate new york and she says we must feed ourselves to free ourselves uh, and uh, I think that that uh, you know captures a lot right there. There's a little bit of mm -hmm. history. I, I have a little bit of a clue as, as to the history of making it illegal for people to grow gardens, like these ordinances that have to do with you can't grow a garden or it has to be a certain way or you're going to get fined. Well, that's a way mm -hmm. of uh, you know that that favors commercial interests, but it doesn't favor people, but it favors commercial interests. The three, the three uh, resources that I want to draw attention to, is, especially if anybody's in the Louisville area, but it, you know, anyway, there's a it, message me if you want to be part of a Louisville area seed swap. I know the people who do that. And, and uh, Jody Dahmer is a friend of mine who is one of the people that's involved in that. Also in the Louisville area, uh, there's a guy named George Barnett. He calls himself the hungry forager. Yeah. And yeah. I've, I've introduced, I've uh, interviewed him and he is just a wealth of knowledge and information about the, you know, including the, the medicinal value of, uh, and he just really opened my eyes to, there's all these opportunities to forage, but you kind of, you need to know what time of year it is and you need to know what you're looking for. But it, it, it's like uh, Kristen was saying, you know, if we get our food that way, then the these corporate powers and have less control over us. And that's what we want. They don't want that, but that's what we want. Yeah, say. I've been in contact with George because I want him to go up, use him as a consultant to walk our farm because we, well, I'm, there's walnut trees out there and all types of mushrooms, which I know nothing about. I mean, I just want to see what else is out there from, you know, that we can use. Don't try them. <laughs> yeah, you know, so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, dandelions, yeah. it's a lot of medicinal sure. things. And I said, I said, I need somebody to come out here to, you know, look at this stuff. So I don't want to do anything and uh, get sick, you know, especially right. like with mushrooms, you know, some of the stuff right. is kind of <laughs> deadly <laughs> yeah, yeah deadly because i looked one up i said oh i don't think we want to touch this leave it alone so yeah, yeah we're gonna, mm -hmm. he's he's a great resource yeah 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 so um and also like what you were just saying about foraging and it being like the cer a, a certain time of year and understanding is you know that's another point that james scott makes in this book is that 
by having diverse food streams, it also makes you smarter. Like for, you know, a, a, a monoculture farmer, you do everything like it's the spring seeding and it's the fall harvest and you're basically on the same schedule every year. And your, your, your worldview and your perspective is really narrowed down by this like one crop that you're responsible to produce. But if you're a hunter gatherer and you're like also a horticulturist and you're also a forager, you have to know about bird migrations and when do the fish swim upstream and when can you know the fish be caught and when are the birds migrating and when do the different animals come that can be hunted and what berries can be picked and then what time of year can you process those and what needs to be dried and what needs to be fermented and what needs to be salted down and your brain is a lot more active and expanded and smarter because you have to know all of these different diverse amazing things around your diverse food supply and the fewer things that we depend on for food like sort of the more narrow and and dumber we get you know so i think also that's um is a really good point and i think it's also like a very uh I read a lot of the the histories of like the European explorers who came to South America and it was something that they didn't understand when they would go into the rainforest and go into the jungle and see people like lolling they would say like these these lazy people just lolling about in their hammocks like you know certain times of year like they're not out there with their plow and they don't take the sickle <laughs> to the soil and they don't know how to work you know what I mean? No, seriously. It was like this right. extremely like narrow, you know, colonial view. And like, meanwhile, they've got fish to salt. They've got berries to ferment. They're making vinegar out of bananas. They've got like cassava in the ground that you can't even see it. And it's like, why? Like, why is drudgery, like the drudgery yeah, right. of like plowing a field, such an awesome thing? Like, right. I think it sucks personally you know what I mean? but this was the mindset that was like glorified was like put your back to the sickle you know yeah. like no <laughs> you know i'm going to my hammock that's you know what I mean? so, right. so i think um yeah you know there's a there's a lot of cultural things there's a lot of really ingrained things in in the culture, you know, that was brought to the Americas from Europe, that is like very much like plow the ground, put your back to the sickle. Now you're a worker, you know what I mean? That is like, we can just completely throw all that out as far as I'm concerned, you know? Yeah. And so human yeah. beings are supposed to use ants as an example. Otherwise poverty will come on you like an armed bandit. That's a kind of a cultural thing. Right. <laughs> No insult to religion or anything, but the book of Proverbs says that, you know, if you're not busy like an ant, poverty will come on you like an armed bandit. You know, you see, you have to be busy, wow. busy, busy, busy all the time. Busy, 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 busy. you know, and it's, right. but it's defining busy in this like extremely narrow way that yeah. you're, you're like be, you're growing a monoculture. You're supposed to be busy for somebody else. You're not supposed to be busy working for yourself or your friends or your neighbors. You're supposed to be busy working for some entity that you don't even understand or, you know. So right, saying. you know, I mean, I'm busy. I'm busy all day long, but like out on the farm, but I, I, I love what I'm do. doing and I, I go out with a, yeah. And I go out with a wheelbarrow and a machete and a bucket and I've got taro and I've got yucca in there and I've got plantains and mint and tropical basil and lemon verbana and lemongrass and lemons and turmeric. And I just come back with like handfuls of this and handfuls of that. And I'm just like six years ago, none of this was here. Mm -hmm. And and now I look, I have all this and I don't have to go to the store, you know, and that's like it's 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 fabulous um so yeah i'm i'm very busy i mean i'm a busy little bee but i'm certainly not you know i don't feel that my life is is in any form of of drudgery and when i talk to this fella from up in saskatchewan and he talks about getting on the combine and being out on the combine in harvest season for 16 hours driving this massive truck that's like as big as a stadium like i'm not even kidding i mean it's like this massive thing it's drudgery like it's really just monotonous sitting on a machine they have thousands of acres and they have three guys running this whole farm because it's all mechanized 
it. Mm -hmm. um, and they're producing a lot of wheat and a lot of barley, and that's basically it. And then when a drought hits, they have, you know, nothing. I mean, I'm not feeling sorry for this family because they're like millionaires, you know, yeah, but I'm right. just saying like very, very vulnerable to like what they do. It's their, their, their revenue stream is narrowed down to one thing. And even though on good years, they make a lot of money, it's a very, very, like very vulnerable revenue stream. And the saddest thing is, it's like they can't even go out on their farm and eat anything. Right. Like there's nothing to eat. Like what are you going to do? Chew dry wheat? Like, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah i mean you know these are all these different ways that um uh we can become like you said like to be to free ourselves ourselves i think that that's that's great you know and it it starts with you kind of get back to like the topic at hand which was like you know the soil sponge which was what i started with is that's where it starts can you hear me I can hear you. Oh, okay. You disappeared for a second. It, it starts with feeding your soil before you can feed yourself. And, and not really feeding the soil itself, not the sand and the clay particles, but the microbes in the soil. You know, you feed those little critters, leaf matter and dead branches and everything that falls. And, and you know, I, when, I, when I talk to people who have like, you know, gardens or small scale farms. I'm like, don't, like, don't worry so much about like bringing in rock dust and elaborate inputs and the, like the chemistry of the soil, like, because the biology is the chemistry. Like right, exactly. Large trees send down deep roots that mine rocks for minerals. They draw the, the minerals up through the trees into the branches, out into the leaves and the leaves fall and the minerals are in the leaves. And just create, you know, make that cycle. You don't have to like go out and buy a bunch of fancy stuff. Like when all your silly neighbors start raking up their leaves and putting them in bags and leaving them on their porches, like just go take it. That's what um, I'm gonna do this year. Go to your municipal. That's <laughs> I was famous. My neighbors were like, "What are you doing with that?" I was like, "Never mind." <laughs> like you yeah. know. Like, um, and, you know, even if you don't want to do that, you can easily call your municipal government and just find out where the pickup center is. You can call any local arborist and they will drop off tree clippings at your house for a very modest fee because to them, you just need to get rid of it and just make piles of all that stuff and leave it on the ground. And next year, guess what? That's your garden. You don't have to kill the weeds. You don't have to dig out the sod. Just leave all that stuff on your soil over the winter. And next, and when spring comes, you have a pile to plant in. And dirt cheap. I mean, literally like dirt cheap. Because during the winter, all the insects and microbes that you're housing, they're doing the work for you. Um, I think also what a lot of people don't realize is one of the reasons why our food is so nutritionally poor is because we're not cultivating soil sponges. We're thinking in a very misinformed way that like the roots of plants are like straws that you just like stick in the soil and they just like suck up nutrients. But that's not at all true. The roots of plants e exchange, to put it in very simple terms, they exchange sugar for nutrients that are shuttled over to the roots by microbes. So it's really the bacteria in the soil that are feeding the nutrients to the plants. They're kind of like, having this little exchange where like they take sugars from the plant root and then they give the plant nutrients in exchange. So without those, that bacterial life in the soil, like nothing happens. You can dump as much liquid fertilizer on the soil as you yeah. want. And the plant will uptake less than 10% of that. It'll take some, don't get me wrong. And it'll get a little bit of like a steroid boost from it, but it's not in any way like a sustained healthy cycle for the plants. It's exactly like giving the plant a shot of steroids and yeah. it, it puffs up and then it withers back down. And that, so, that synthetic you know, fertilizer um, actually inhibits the plant's ability to produce what it needs to produce to attract the biology. So you know, plants don't just sugars. take from yeah. the ground, you know, about 40% of the carbon. Uh, so plants get 
carbon from the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide, they take that and, and, and turn it into sugars. Uh, about 40% of those sugars go into the, into the root exudate. So the, they exude right. these liquid sugars out of the roots that attracts the bacteria and the fungi. Right. And that puts in this whole process in motion. That's how the plant gets the nutrients it needs. That's how the plant gets right. a lot of the water that it needs. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you, you destroy that whole process when you use synthetic fertilizers and you also destroy much of that process when you till. So what you're saying to right. do is instead of tilling, uh, bring in your organic matter and put it on top and then plant that next year. Right. Yeah. And you might need, like, if you're just getting started, like it, it might not, it probably isn't going to break down enough over one winter to actually create like soil. Mm -hmm. You're going to end up with like a bunch of kind of like half decomposed leaf matter but that's fine because what you can do is you can dig up soil from somewhere else or maybe even have to resort to some like bagged soil from a like a compost center or something like leaf compost would be fine like that's fully composted and you can actually just i used to do this all the time and you can just make little holes in your like your your half decomposed pile and just plant in those like little plugs you know what i mean then as the summer goes on as your pile continues to get digested and break down then the plant roots can start actually accessing from the material as it's breaking down so this will also save you if you're starting a new garden from buying bags and bags and bags of garden soil maybe you buy one bag of garden soil just to get you started instead of 20 bags because now you're just basically helping the seeds to get germinated you know so that's like a kind of a a nice middle of the road solution i think for a new gardener you know what i mean but after about Valerie three has a seasons question. of your pile go ahead uh so my question is because i've been running into this dilemma for the past two years in my backyard I have patches of soil which is that are really, really hard. So I've done the leaves, added dirt, um, the whole cardboard and newspaper thing and wet it down in the uh -huh. winter, but it still is rock hard. Like I can put some plants down. I got some perennials down in there, but others are not thriving like I want them to. And I think it has something to do with the ground right. being so hard. Uh, so if yeah. you keep doing this, would it eventually get soft enough to where it'll eventually get soft enough, but also putting the, the like the deep tap rooted perennials in there it was that's also really going to help because those the root systems of those deep tap roots like try to also find like perennials that have really deep rigorous like roots that will like thrust into the ground and help you out. You might even want to think, consider putting in a crop of like um, yellow beets or mango or rutabaga or daikon or something like that. You might not get anything edible out of it. it. Like it wouldn't be to eat, but the purpose of it would be to plunge into the soil for you. We did the same thing here with cassava, like yucca roots, because they're really big, powerful tubers. And our soil was so tight and so compacted because from the cow stomping around on it and the force of the rain and not having any organic matter, it was actually turning blue. Like you would get down into the subsoil and it was purplish because there was just no oxygen in it, no insects, no tunnels, nothing. And so we put uh, cuttings from cassava tubers in there. And the first cassava crop that we harvested, it was terrible. Like they were all skinny. They were, they weren't very good. Like they weren't, they were kind of edible, but like not all that great, but it was a great way. It was kind of like a natural rotiller. So I would use like big roots, big, tough roots. Daikon is, I think is a really good one for where you are in the United States. And you might, like I said, you might not get an edible crop out of it, but they'll, it'll open up your soil for you kind of like to plunge in there, you know, and that's, that's a big help to use uh, a, use a root crop as a soil tiller. So Christian, you named daikon rad. I keep saying Christian, Kristen, you named daikon yeah, radish uh -huh. and what else? Yellow beets. Um, yellow beets are pretty, they're, they're, they're heat resistant. So um, I think mango is, I've, 
I've never grown it, but I've read that it's it's a really good root crop for opening up tough soil. And um, rutabagas are great for opening up tough soil. Rutabagas are mm-hmm. big, strong roots that can really plunge in there. Um, horseradish is a great perennial to grow in, in tight in tight soil. It can really open up tight soil. I've had good experience opening up tight soil with rutabagas, horseradish, and yellow beets, personally, myself. Um, because I was in Washington, D.C., which it's, it's very clay there. And most of the soil, if you're in a backyard, you're working with like construction backfill, which is just like, it's pure clay. So I would, you know, I had good yeah. Like, root crops. Yeah. So, yeah, try that. Keep adding your leaf matter and try, try some deep rooted root crops and deep rooted, you know, perennials with deep tap roots. And I think that'll help you over the next, uh, definitely over the next season. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have questions? All right. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, So I don't consider myself as having done really anything except for learn and then talk about it. (laughs) And through through talking about it, I've gotten other people excited who have like two or three acres behind their house, but they're like, yeah come and grow an orchard that would be cool that way i wouldn't have to grow the grass or cut the grass and then um and then you could give that food away to food pantries or whatever um because i'm I'm kind of all about the mutual aid aspect of food forestry right now so when you said that you went from your i think seven or seven and a half acres to your neighbors being excited and suddenly you were tending to like 30 or 35 acres I'm wondering, is that similar where like I have people saying, yeah, come tend my property. Are you, did your neighbors say, yes, come tend our properties that are adjacent to yours? And how did that, how did that work out for you? And um, how did, how did those negotiations go as far as um, what happens if they don't own the, the land in 10 years, but your trees are just now starting to mature in 10 or 15 years? Right. Um, what we actually did was we came in and we found uh, nine lots that had been subdivided in a small enclosure that were all uh, three hectares each, all about eight acres each. And um, we bought one of those lots and the rest of them were all still for sale. It was an old farmer, an old dairy farmer who was actually one of the original lumberjacks who cut down the forest around here. And he had subdivided the land for his kids. He had nine kids. And then they just told him like, dad, I don't want this. Like, I'm, I don't want to be a farmer. So then he put them up for sale and we came up and we bought one. So we didn't have any neighbors. Like they, we didn't have neighbors. Like people have, I put it on our website that this is what we're doing. There's this land for sale in Ecuador. We're doing regeneration project. Like, do people want to come down and and join it? And so that's how we actually got neighbors was we, we kind of advertised like, Hey, there's some cheap land down here in Ecuador and we're doing uh, regeneration agroforestry on it. We want to grow cacao which is like, you know, the seed that makes chocolate. And that's a very, like it thrives in agroforestry and we're we're focusing a lot on cacao right now. Um, So we attracted people. People came down essentially to be our neighbors and not knowing that much about tropical agroforestry and then being like, well, you seem to be, your your project is doing pretty well. Can you guide us in what we're doing? So now I've all like we've also t- taken on the mantle of sort of like food forest designer for our new neighbors. So that's how it worked, you know, was we came in, we took over a plot of land that didn't have anything on it. We put some things on it. We put it online. People got excited by it. They wanted to do it, too. And now we we help them with it. We advise them. So um, I don't think anybody that's come down and and uh, has bought land is gonna sell it in the next 10 years or so. I think that they're in it for the long term. But one thing I wanna be very clear about is that I believe that by adding value to deforested plots of land, by planting them with profitable polyculture systems, you certainly reduce the temptation for the next person to come along and take out all your trees. 
because now your trees are more than timber. They're more than just straggly pioneers and shrubs that are just there for the birds. They also can benefit whoever comes along and buys that land. I don't think anybody coming along that's buying a land that's already in a productive cultivated state is gonna be so willing or want to cut that all down and turn it into a cow pasture. Um, so I, you know, I think that that's, um, it's really important. And it's, it's something that I, it's like, it's kind of like hard to walk the line on because you want to talk about like being free of, you know, corporations and, and having this, like this new way of life. And at the same time, as like someone who really wants to promote agroforestry as a viable way of producing food, I also have to speak the language of business to some extent right. to be like, this is, this is a process of adding value, right? Right. So let's not come in and cut all this down because we're also adding value. You know, I think a really great step forward for the regenerative movement in general would be to have novel accounting systems that take into consideration your green fertilizer crops, the ecological services that all your polycultures are producing, the increased soil health without having to buy inputs. And right now we don't have like a way to quantify those additional resources that like growing a polyculture accomplishes. And I, I personally, that would be a great step forward because I'll tell you what, Monsanto Bayer and all the bad guys, they have their math, you know, like they've got their story. And I think it would be really great for the regenerative movement to have like this, the, the statistical story, you know what I mean? Like a, a novel form of accounting that can actually take account for the value that you add to land, not just in food value, but also in fertilizer, in, in not having to buy all those chemicals, not having to truck the chemicals in, and also the combined value of all of the, um, the crops that you're growing. So that's just, but I kind of like walk the line on that because I'm like, well, I don't know. Like, do I really want to, like, do I want to have to speak that language? Like, should I even really have to, right? But then that's kind of like, I think idealism, you know, it's like, how do you balance between the idealism and the pragmatism of, of living in this world that we still live in, which is pretty corrupt and like pretty horrible, but walking that tightrope fine enough that you can still like get things done. And like, you know, the guy who just asked the question is like, still get people excited about it and still bring in outsiders because everybody else is still living in that world, right? right. In the world of the, the capitalist economy or like whatever. And it's like, you have to be able to talk to people in a way that, that appeals to them from like meet people where they are. And then when they get a little bit like over the line and they start seeing the benefits of the wildlife and the ecosystem, like then they'll loosen up a little bit, I think, because we, we've had that experience. We've had that experience with like one of our investors who at first was very like, yeah, I want to grow cacao and, and be like this like chocolate empire or whatever. And now he's just like, yeah, I just, I, I'm, I'm glad I have a, a cash crop, but I'm also really happy with like, like what's happening with the reforestation, you know? And, and so I don't know. I, I don't know. What do you think, Hart? I kind of like go back and forth on this. Like, well, do you think I mean, it's necessary um, to run as a business? Uh, I think one of the big selling points of regenerative agriculture, it's like, how, how do we uh, transition quickly if I could wave a magic wand, one of the main things I would want to see happen in the world, probably one of the top three, if not the number one thing I'd like to see happen in the world, is how quickly can we transition from this misuse and abuse of the land that we have now that is called a food system, but it's really a, it's a, it's an anti-food system, but hey, how quickly right. can we transfer to that, transition from that to regenerative agriculture, which can be profitable. Uh, for one thing, right. you're not putting out all the money for inputs year after year. For another thing, you're not selling a commodity to a monopoly. The worst thing you can do 
uh, you know, you're, you're really putting yourself at a disadvantage if you try to sell a commodity to a monopoly. So a commodity is something the price. that monopoly can get anywhere. And the, the monopoly is you, you either buy from that, you either sell to that monopoly or you don't sell anybody because they're the only game in town. So most farmers in are town, playing yeah. that game. What they could do instead is, uh, you know, take a farm and add value to it year after year. The, if the soil carbon goes up year after year after year, then your fertility is going up year after year. If your soil carbon is going up year after year, then your ability to of your soil to retain water goes up year after year. So plus, if on top of that, you're right. adding biological diversity, you have a place that's very paradisical or you know it's a paradise it's it's something that's very nice and it that you also things. don't have to well, irrigate it does have, well, it does have economic value it is non-toxic so it's you don't have to you wear a hazmat suit to go into it uh, and it, anyway so but adding value to your whatever property you have adding value to it year after year after year gives you something that you can retire on gives you something that if you want to sell it at the end of the game you can sell it or or do you want to have that or do you want to have something where the soils are depleted and the soils are eroded and the the, the soil has very little value there's nothing there in terms of biodiversity um you know so i, I don't i don't have numbers in front of me but i'm strongly persuaded that there is a way for farmers and other landowners and land managers to add to the value to that year after year. And I think it's valid and legitimate to say to, to, you know, to kind of be an entrepreneur in the sense of I'm going to take this low value asset, I'm going to add value to it, and then I'm going to sell it to for a higher value. And like you said, if it has all of this value because of the biodiversity, then that diminishes the chance that somebody's going to come in and remove all the trees, you know? Right. Yeah. And I've actually, um, I've actually talked about this with people in like fairly high up in like the World Agroforestry Forest Stage, like World Ag World Agroforestry Foundation, and some other like you know whatever high ranking NGOs or whatever. Like I don't get too impressed by this stuff, but they they agree and they say like having governments put land in conservation is actually like one of the worst things that you can do for biodiversity preservation because what happens is like it just it, there could be a regime change you could have a a bolsonaro in brazil or a guillermo lasso here in ecuador or a donald trump in the united states that like whatever the regime change is the person doesn't matter but the regime change itself they can just switch up all the rules and they can take land out of conservation like at the snap of a finger they just have to get the right ruling on it or get the Senate behind them or whatever. And then all the efforts to conserve that land just go up in smoke and they can put a pipeline through it. They can frack on it. They can do whatever they want. Whereas if grassroots groups are owning that land and our stakeholders in that land and are adding value to that land through biodiversity and food production and food sovereignty and living on the land in a way that doesn't damage it, I think that that gives a much longer lifespan to the potential for that land to be kept fertile and abundant and productive than if you just hand it over to a government that can just change the rules with the snap of a finger. And then the next thing you know, there's fracking or mining on that land. Um, and people who have a lot of experience with government policy, like they see this decade after decade after decade, how many how many hectares of rainforest are taken out of conservation every year by by their own the governments of those right, countries right. to allow people to go in and drill for oil? I mean, you know? the U.S. Forest and, Service and the Bureau of Land Management, you know, manage most of the public lands in the U.S. and they're freaking they're in they're in the logging business and they are in the minerals business. They, you know, that's how right. they earn a great good part of their revenue. It is, uh, it's, a, it's little known, it's, but I, I hear what you're saying. So it could be that, you know, private property is like 
this thing that's I think you know private property on a small scale is a good thing and what you're saying is that it's possible for private property to even be a better protection than having pop property that's owned by the public or the government can change the rules just you know in the blink of an eye all of a sudden in the blink of an eye not protected anymore and even also if it's like yeah, and yeah. governments don't have a very good record of actually managing forests mm -hmm. in a way that prevents wildfires. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to just kind of like let it go. There's a lot of letting it go because most of the money in the government doesn't go towards forestry management. It goes into prisons and the military. So, you know, very little money in the government, especially in the United States, is actually in forestry management. And I know this for a fact because a very close friend of mine worked in forestry management for the U.S. government. And she's like, we have no money. Like the amount that we're allotted every year is like it's minuscule compared to the amount of work that needs to be done. So you end up with a lot of like old growth forest that's in a state of decay. And decaying forest is like it's a wild it's a recipe for a wildfire to go through it, whereas if you have a managed forest. People tend to think that like human intervention is is always bad, but it, it depends on the mindfulness of the intervention, so if you have a well managed forest that is not allowed to go into its apex state and start decaying, but is kept by pruning and replanting in a constant state of syntropic regeneration it's not going to catch on fire it's not going to decay it's going to be managed by the people who are the stakeholders in it to not be a destructive system to be a regenerative system um and you see that here a lot in ecuador in the rainforest there are groups um not just indigenous groups but just all sorts of stakeholder groups that have small properties in the rainforest that that manage their forests, intensively manage their forests, where they have crops of balsa followed by uh, crops of hardwoods and then interplanted, they have their cacao cash crop and the, the forest is kept in a constant state of growth and regeneration. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm all for people owning their lands who know how to work it without destroying it. I mean, I think that it's, it's on a small scale, it's, it's much more effective. Um, so yeah. Was there a question that we yeah. missed? Helga from Chile has a question. Well, let me read her question. Her microphone is on. I saw mute. something flash across the screen, so. What? So I saw something flash across the screen. So here's the question. How many hectares do you think it is necessary to regenerate to start activating the biotic pump in an environment with a Mediterranean climate. So she's in Chile, so it's a Mediterranean climate mm -hmm. that is currently right. in a super yeah. drought. Uh, that's, that's my crazy dream, but I really don't know if it's possible. I live in Chile. Thanks, Helga. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm not going to say I can answer that because my my experience is in a subtropical wet forest. Um, I'm not going to speak to something that I don't know. Um, I would venture to say it might be less than you think. Um, I have read that in there's people working in in northeastern Spain, which I believe has a similar climate to a Mediterranean climate, yeah. very arid with like a very short rainy season. Um, and I have a friend working in northeastern Spain, uh, Oliver Gaucher, who hosts the Regenerative Skills podcast. And, and he's working with people there, and they're talking about like 10,000 square kilometers at a time to start restoring small water cycles on a 10,000 square kilometer um, uh, uh, level. And I, I, that's not very much. How much would that 10,000 square kilometers in hectares? I'd have to do the math on that. What's well, 100 kilometers Hector by 10,000 square. So it's like 100 uh, by 100 miles. Is, it's like 65 miles by 65 miles. Well, I don't, I don't know how to convert kilometers to hectares, but no, so, so a hectare I, is 10,000 square meters. So Kristen, yeah, this, this, this kind of question keeps that keeps coming up and I may or may not ever have an answer to it. We might have to start kind of 
finding anecdotal examples, case studies of how uh, you know rainfall goes up, but rainfall is but it's a it's if it's a it's an equation with a lot of inputs with a lot of variables. There's so many variables. It, it's kind of hard to imagine right. a really scientific study uh, going into this. But what we have to understand is that, it's, yes, it, it, it's not just rainfall. Yes, trees and enough vegetation is going to increase your rainfall, even a small amount, I think, of, of true, truly dense cover is going to increase your rainfall uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but you have to understand that it's not just the rain that you get, it's the rain that you keep. So it's how, you keep. Good, how good are your soils? Is your rain uh, soaking into the soils? It, it, you know, it, so every, any amount of vegetation is worth something. Any amount of intelligence, yeah. you know, adding green matter, uh, making healthy soils, Maybe you want to do a little, you know, swale on contour or a small pond, that kind of thing. All that helps. Uh, I just think mm -hmm. it's not how much rain falls from the sky. It's how much is, is in the soil. And it's like you can increase the period of green growth. If, if your soil is healthy, right. then if your water table is good, and if you have a diversity of plants, they tend to be able to thrive even you know, with a minimal amount, it tends to optimize the amount of water that you yeah. have when you have, you know, mature. Because you have systems, root systems on different thing. levels. So it's a right. Adding plant yeah, and I think also the amount of no lose. Like no I know people who do um, who do xeriscaping in New Mexico in the United States, where they're not really out to increase the rainfall. What they're out to increase is the amount of moisture that you can right. hold closest to the ground. Yeah. So I think that's also like a really important factor in an arid climate is maybe you're not going to get massive amounts of rain, but you if you can hold more moisture closest to the ground with drought resistant low level plants, you can create damp microclimates within certain pockets of soil where then you can begin to germinate like larger trees. Like in John Liu's famous project in the Los Plateau in China, they didn't go in there and start planting trees. They started with very low level drought resistant grasses and, and, and crawling plants close to the ground because they, they just needed to hold the powder down at first. And it's the same thing that people do with xeriscaping in New Mexico is it's just about restricting the ability of the winds to keep flying everything around so that nothing can take hold. So you, you move in a graduated system of pioneers, like a pioneer succession system, just like we do here in the rainforest with bananas and cassava as pioneers, but on a, a much like smaller and closer to the ground level where you start with crawling plants on the ground and then you can graduate to prairie grasses and then, may, then maybe shrubs eight or 10 years later, and then maybe you start putting in trees. And then within 30 years, maybe you start seeing more rain. But I think that understanding how different biospheres work and like understanding what you need to do first is key because like, especially in countries like Chile and in uh, dry areas of Mexico, there have been massive reforestation projects over the last five years where only 3% of the planted trees survived. Right. Because they just sent armies right. to plant trees. Yeah. And they right. didn't start with with ground covers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, tree planting, I'm all for tree planting because I'm in a rainforest. But I mean, it's you, you got to understand how your biosphere works and you need to follow a succession system just like nature would. If you have a an area that's like going from savanna to desert and, and it, it starts to get like a little bit of regrowth it's not going to start germinating trees. It's just going to start growing little patches of weeds and let those, let, let that grow. You know what I mean? People have this idea a lot of times that um, sort of those like scrubby growths that you see sucking out of cracks that they rob water. That's no, robbing water no. from my plants. No. no, that's creating water for your right. plants. Right. You know? Water robbers. No. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's, the best way I can answer that question is really like if you're in an arid climate, it might not be of 
a fast goal or something to think about even maybe in the course of a, a generation or a lifetime, but over the course of your own life, like how much moisture can you start to accumulate in your area that could become rain in the future? And, you know, when you're talking about moisture, it's like a much more subtle variable, but it, it rain starts from vapor rain starts from moisture it doesn't it's not just like big balls of water that fall from the sky um well so that's how i would kind of like indirectly there's, a, a, there's an ample amount of water vapor in the sky but it doesn't come down because it lacks it those nuclei for precipitation plus a, a rain it's like i live in an urban heat island and the rain will go around us because the rain cannot yeah. penetrate that urban heat island. So we need ways of breaking up that urban heat island with uh, vegetation, with, uh, so we need ways of making the microclimate cooler and wetter so that rain can penetrate when it does come. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back to the, the, the bearded fellow who asked the question, who says, like, I don't really do regenerative, like, agriculture, but I, I'm learning about it, is I find that people like that, like, they make great networkers, and they make great people to sort of, like, take on the institutions, because I have, like, no interest. I'm just, like, I'm going to Ecuador. I have no building codes, no regulations. Like, I do whatever I want. I'm not, I'm not a born, like, rebel in that, like, way. But there are people who are, who really excel at that. And I have a friend, a very close friend, who lives in a, a she moved into a community in Florida with her new husband. And they had one of those really persnickety HOAs and they didn't want the housing authorities and they didn't want them to put a garden in their yard. They took them on. They took the HOA on. And they're like, no, we're going to submit a plan and we're going to grow the garden that we want. We're going to let you know what it is and we're going to fight you. And you know what? They backed their HOA down. And the thing is, is you like with a lot of these sort of persnickety overseer neighborhood supervisors, like they're, they're like they're kind of like cowards at heart. Like if you really face them down, like they'll usually back down because they really just don't want to deal. They want to come over to your yard and be like, you shouldn't have a rain barrel and you shouldn't have this kind of grass and like blah, blah, blah. But like if you if you really buck the system, like most, of the, I've talked to several people who have taken on their HOAs and made their HOAs back down. So I think a lot of it is just like not being intimidated by people and their like made up authority and, and just being like, no, I'm going to have a rain barrel and I'll fill out your form or go online or do your proposal or fight you or whatever it is. And I think that people can do like a lot more to buck the system than they think because the people who are, running these like neighborhood gangs of authority like they're really not all that invested in it like mm. in their heart of hearts mm. like you know what i mean <laughs> it's just kind of like you know at the end of the day because what do they really have to gain or lose by you having pumpkins in your backyard you know it's like so everybody I've talked to, I've talked to three people, I've interviewed three people at this point, and my friend in Florida actually wrote a blog piece for me who have successfully backed down their HOAs on putting in neighborhood gardens. So I think like people that want to network and kind of like get people rallied up and get people excited and maybe not be like regenerative farmers themselves, I think that they have like a really important function. And it, it, I think that's like part of it is sort of like, rallying people to the cause to buck their systems you know what i mean not everybody's going to move out of their de suburban development and come to ecuador and do a regenerative farm i understand that but it's like don't be a victim to where you live like don't put astroturf in your yard just because like somebody said you should you know what i mean it's so you know i think that there's there's there's, there's different roles like for everybody depending on their personality just like there's different regenerative systems that can work for different biospheres you know everybody's got like something to give here everybody's got something to do so that's how i see it right so yeah um i'm kind of like done i don't have much <laughs> else to say <laughs> <I'm kinda> like... <laughs> no we want you to go for so, another hour um, no <laughs>
<laughs> but um, does anybody else have any other questions or just want to say anything or contribute something? Anyway. I know okay. I'm, I'm excited well, about buying, um, like, like I live in uh, the West End of Louisville and uh, I'm kind of putting my feelers out to, uh, there's like four properties within a few doors of me that are owned by the city land bank. And I'm just really eager to acquire them and start building the soil and start planting what I can plant and bringing in wood chips and leaves and that kind of thing. So that's what I'm excited about. And um, yeah, cool. I'm excited about acquiring the 200 hectares next to us. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and growing nutrient dense superfoods to feed the world. That's right. my <laughs> so, superfoods yeah. for supermen. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway. Um, so anyway, yeah. This, from this Swain is great. Davida, thank you so much uh, for being our very high energy uh, guest, and uh, thank you for what you're doing in Ecuador. And we're going to talk again soon. And thank you for all of our guests who uh, came yeah. with, with uh, questions and so forth. Yeah, and guys, um, we have a website where I blog, and uh, it's the website is um, www.sdvforest.com, and uh, I think that's in my bio on the the notes. And I have a blog called DIY Living where I speak a lot from my experience as like an urban grower and it's you know there's a lot of good tips in there on seed saving um mulching your soil um using water effectively in your garden so even though now i'm in ecuador and i also write a lot about agroforestry i also still write about like bringing it home for you know like people back in temperate climates so yeah there's a lot of free resources there so please go go check out our website and like enjoy the content in the blog because i i write it so i write it for free and i don't expect anything for it i just want to be able to like help people who want to get their own food sovereignty so go check it out and um yeah so thank you everybody thank you Kristen. yeah okay ciao bye bye bye, bye. How do I stop this?